Hallelujah. Let Lord Jesus Christ shine forth. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are joining us. Welcome to live stream with TCCI Ministries. And I have found the films with me as well as Jihad Watch video is with me. Jay Smith and Robert Spencer. Peace of Christ be with you guys. And with you. Thank you. Um, how are you doing? Uh, let's go with Jay since he's on the left hand side are you on the left jay i'm on the right on mine on the left to you that's fine <laughs> listen i'm i'm here in england i'm at a friend's house i'm in london and i've been here for about two weeks with my wife and uh, we've come to see our grandson so i'm finally a grandfather after after being 71 years old it's nice to be a granddad uh then i'm doing a lot of speaking and doing a lot of uh recording on some of the material that we're going to talk about tonight good welcome to london and how are you, Robert Spencer? I'm not in London. You are not or... in London. I hope you are not in Florida. <laughs> no, no. Uh, uh, I pray for those people there, but I am not there. It is very, actually, a beautiful day here. And so thank you for coming on. And it's nice to see both of you. Good. So, um, you. Uh, Robert, you put a book together. I, how many books is this? 28 or something? 29? That's, 20, that's the 28th, yes. This is the 28th book. I think your 29th book is on its way. It'll be out in uh, March or so. They they hold them for such a long time. But okay. it's all done. And uh, that one is about anti-Semitism. And I was just moments ago working on the 30th, uh, which is about Islam and society and how it is a failed system for... Uh, prosperity and for the well-being of a society and that one should be out next around this time next year okay. God willing we'll see what happens a lot could happen between now and then so this is your 28th book did you know yeah. how many books I, I have written I don't know how many how many Hatun not even zero yet well you're you know so much you could write dozens <laughs> and I look forward to reading them Jay how many books have you got <laughs> Okay, I'm with you, Atun. We don't. I've not written any books. Everybody's asking me to write a book, and I keep on saying, "I'm gonna let I'm gonna let Robert write my books for me." Because <laughs> every time I come up with new material, send it to him, he writes it, and by the time he writes it, it's already out of date. So, <laughs> well, you know, uh, I'm just gonna keep feeding him and let him write episode after episode after episode, and make him nice, filthy rich to pass on to his. <laughs> That's uh, unfortunately not happening, but in any case, uh, you all, you both are 21st century uh, analysts, and I'm a 20th century analyst because books are, are from the past. It's all videos now, but uh, never been able to get videos going myself. And I'm much more comfortable writing books and let you make all the videos, so well, it, it works out well. Our God is unique. He gifted people, gifted his people differently, and we are accountable to use those gifts to serve yes, him. Yes, exactly. So, 28th book is about Muhammad, and this is his critical biography. And you've got kind of non-traditional view of Muhammad, as well as Jay has non-traditional version of Muhammad. So, traditional version of Muhammad is, <laughs> that's what Muslim people grow up, and majority of non-Muslims are aware that, um, he is the prophet of Islam, was born in 570 in Mecca, died 632 in Medina. And he is, uh, we've got, he, he kind of put together, uh, re he received the revelation from Allah 610 to 632, died, Quran is the revelation he received. And then we've got Hadith, simply tells us his customs, as well as we've got the, his biographies. One of the earliest one is Ibn Isaq. Ibn Hisham. Uh, and Muhammad is also someone whom Muslims kill for. And that's like just they follow the traditional account, they follow the Quran, they follow the Hadith, and then they can kill for Muhammad. Uh, today, approximately how many billion, two billion Muslims put their faith in Muhammad, and you both kind of disagree with traditional account. Am I right to understand that? That is correct, yes. I think we're two of the only ones that disagree and say so. There are many hundreds of others that do, but they won't say so publicly. It's not yes. It's not healthy to say that publicly. Um, it's, it's true. It's increasingly clear, though. There are many people 
uh, who it's becoming more well known that there are problems with the history. And as Jay has spoken about, and both of you have spoken about many times, even some uh, Muslim scholars have now admitted that the standard story just doesn't hold up and that there has to be some alternative explanation. Okay, so um, your book, con your latest book co um, contains um, different accounts about Muhammad and from that you are kind of asking, can this be the prophet of Islam whom Muslims put their faith on and can we trust these accounts, correct? Yes, uh, I show all through the book that there are different versions of the stories with which many people are familiar now. A lot of people think, well, why would I need to read another biography of Muhammad? I already know he was a warlord, he was a killer, he was a pedophile, all these things that uh, are well established now and are mainstream among people who have looked into this. But uh, this book is different in that I show that even those stories and many others are uh, controverted in Islamic tradition itself, that there are different versions of the stories, sometimes that differ quite a bit from one another, and that that indicates that we're dealing with myths and legends and not with sober historical records. Okay, so am I right to assume that you don't believe Muhammad as the prophet of Islam was ever existed? That's right. There may have been someone, or I think actually there were a number of people that they may have done some of the things that are described in the Hadith and that their stories then were folded into this Muhammad legend. But Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, as he is depicted in a standard Islamic account with all the familiar elements of the story that we know, that he started out preaching, and then he moved to Medina and became a military and political leader, and he led battles and all those things. That's all fictional. Okay. Yeah. And where do you stand on that, Jay, since you have no books? <laughs> I don't need to have a book to stand, take a position. You know where I stand. I agree wholeheartedly with Robert Spencer. And I think the reason why, I, I remember uh, debating this way back in 1995, uh, with Dr. Jamal Badawi. I said, I made that question uh, in the last century. And I remember at that debate in Cambridge University, I came out with 10 different challenges, all of whom I got from Dr. Patricia Kuruna, who was uh, there at, she was at Cambridge University at that time, having had written already Hagarism and and uh, the, the Meccan trade in the, in the rise of Islam. So already has been putting forth that there are some real problems with the biography of Muhammad. There are some real problems with the whole origins of Islam. And I went to her office the week before and, and for three hours, I just put together 10 different challenges, many her challenges. And Dr. John Badawi, after hearing this for the first time, the leading scholar at that time on the Quran in the English speaking language, his only response was, well, this is an argument from silence, and the absence of evidence does not prove the evidence of absence, which is true. I mean, at the, in 1995, that's all he could say, and I couldn't say any more either, but that was 1995. We're now in 2024. We no longer are arguing from silence, and we're not arguing without evidence. We have all the evidence, and why this book is so important is that Robert Spencer is now cap tabulating and taking what other people have found and putting it into a book form so we can read it with sourcing all the material there. No longer is there an abs uh, absence of evidence. There's all kinds of evidence. And that's why the entire debate now has changed 180 degrees since 1995. Okay. So um, in that case, I'll ask a couple of very basic questions. Uh, so I know um, JV did live stream regarding the reliability of the Islamic sources, Islamic traditions, and then you brought up references after references, how those sources were pretty much laid. And we don't have the originals, it's all made up. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Robert, are you familiar? Are you aware of all the extant manuscripts, the dates for all the extant manuscripts of the Sirah and the Hadith and the Tafsir and the Tahrik? and the Sahaba and the Tabiyun? Oh, of course, they're all in the book. And uh, uh, Hatun and I actually also did a video on uh, this recently because 
we were uh, answering the same video that the same video that you all you both answered that uh, the Islamic apologist Farid produced, claiming that uh, he actually was working from an earlier video of yours, Jay, where uh, he was you were say noting how late all the sources were, and he was pointing he was a, a purporting to point out that there were earlier sources that you were not acknowledging. And uh, you you went through, and Hatun and I also went through his video, and I showed that uh, all, all the sources he adduced are actually just as late or later than the ones that you were say, you were referring to, or uh, else they were not what he was representing them to be. Yeah. And he this was is this not is being honest. This is why it's fascinating. Muslims do not want to put dates to anything. It's when you put dates that it shuts down every one of these arguments. You've got to introduce the dates. You can put name after name. I remember uh, Farid was just pulling these one book after another off the shelves, yeah. pulling these different books, and said, what about this one? What about this one? What about this one? And it was fascinating that he had no dates for any of them. In fact, he didn't even know what he was talking about. And they walked themselves into a trap by doing that. Exactly. So God, because, uh, the date. The, 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 Oh, sorry. I was just going to say he was referring to writers uh, from the seventh century, from the eighth century, rather, and saying that they were early. When actually, we only have the manuscripts of that that were that were written by their followers much later, in the time of the people that you were referring to, Bukhari and all the rest of the 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 people who put together the canonical hadith. So he, he had no case whatsoever. And this is this is true all the way through of the uh, people who try to work with the Islamic sources that uh, they, as you say, they have to f not name any dates and just give the accounts of Muhammad as if they're contemporary and yeah. or or within the lifetime of Muhammad's followers. Otherwise, if if people realize they're two hundred years later, then they know it's very clear they don't have any reliability. And we're not saying two hundred years. We're talking about all, all the way up to 600 years, in some cases, 800 years later. Yes. This is why and we've got to get this out there. We've got to get people to look at the real dates, put them on timelines, and just shut down this debate. Because if this Muhammad is that important, if he is the greatest of all prophets, the seal of all prophets, and if he is... If, if he is actually lived in history, as Hatun just got done saying, born in 570, start receiving revelations in 610, and then dying in 632, why is there no reference about that story? No reference about the story. In fact, the first ma manuscript we don't get is not till 1063. That's mm -hmm. the 11th century. Yep. 11th century, folks. So you can see this is, this is not just 200 years after. This is 400 years too late. And that's only 5% of the Siddha that we have today. Yes. So, I've got this in the book, actually. I've got to say that uh, uh, people think of Ibn Hisham as collecting a great deal of Ibn Ishaq's work. And Ibn Hisham is the early part of the ninth century. But as uh, Jay knows, this is in the book because I was in consultation with him when I wrote it, that uh, th these manuscripts actually date from the uh, 15th century or later. And so there could, they could have been undergone any, any, they could have gone a, undergone a huge amount of revision from the time of Ibn Isham to the time of the manuscripts that were actually used by first Wüstenfeld, the German scholar in the 19th century, and then Alfred Guillaume, who of course famously translated what he referred to as the Sirat Rasulullah of Ibn Ishaq, into English in the 20th century, yeah, uh, these yeah. things are, are are hundreds of years removed yeah. from when they were supposed to have been written. Now, can, just put it on, put that on the side. Take that and apply that to Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. who we look as as the man who is our model, who is our um, who is our paradigm. If we if we were if we were dependent on manuscript evidence for Jesus Christ like Muslims are dependent for Muhammad. Just the date. I mean, 1063 is the first one that comes up. 
Uh, the other ones that are in the British Library, that's 1278. The one that's in the uh, Bodleian Library, that is 1234. The one that's in the Chester Beatty Library, that's 1331. The one that's in Paris, the Bibliothèque Nationale uh, Library, that's 1420. And the one you're referring to that's there in the S School of Oriental and African Studies Library, that's 1598. That means you put all those six together, that's what Wollstonefell finally did in 18, 1860, in the 19th mm -hmm. century. If we were dependent on that for Jesus Christ, we would have nothing appear. There would be no Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John until the 4th century, and that we would have to start putting manuscripts together that continue all the way up into the 8th century. That's long after Islam was already in play, mm -hmm. before we could even put together the life of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine? How would we defend Jesus? And yet Muslims are not have not been told this. Muslims yeah. do not even are not even aware of just how hopeless the story of their prophet is. It's a massive difference, and it's illustrative because I'll tell you something. The first thing I get when I wrote "Did Muhammad Exist?" and now with this book, when I'm doing interviews with uh, you know a radio station or something, they always say it's the first question all the time. Can't you say the same thing about Jesus? <laughs> and I tell them, look, you know, you've got in the first century, in the first century, you've got you've got the apostolic fathers quoting the Gospels and thus indicating that they existed. You've got manuscripts from of the New Testament from the first century. There are Muslims, of course, who try to represent uh, certain manuscripts as being Quran manuscripts from the seventh century. But it's not even clear, actually, when you start looking at the whole history, that those are Quran at all. Yeah, they yeah. could be they could be the source material that became the Quran. That became the Quran. That's exactly it. I mean, they, and that's why it's it's so good that you're writing this book, and it's so good that yeah, okay, we need to get back to Hutton. We can go sit there, you and I, Robert, and just continue this for a whole hour. Let's give back and give Hutton and her say. Sorry, apologies. No, no, I, no, no, that's fine. I just wanted to ask a question. Yes. So, um, I am looking from the evangelist perspective. Um, as a Christian, we are told. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've got to preach the glorious gospel of Lord Jesus Christ. And one of the ways we do it is challenging the teachings of Islam and then introducing gospel, breaking down all the button, button barriers and then introducing um, his glorious gospel. So when I put it in practice, what can I say? I think you will have both of you have different version or different answer. What can I say when Muslim turns to me and then says, Muhammad was born in... Um, 570 in Mecca and he started receiving his revelation which is the first one is surah 96 in 610 so what does traditional account tells us and then what does uh historical account tells us well you could say in the first place that uh, it, it would be very difficult for you to acknowledge muhammad as a prophet when you can't even be sure there was such a person and that in the in the seventh century there's no indication of anybody mentioning such an individual. There are a few scattered references to Muhammad and not a single one of them corresponds to what we hear about the life of the prophet of Islam from the ninth century sources. And then the ninth century sources themselves don't agree about that material because even his name is controverted. Uh, as is well known now, I believe, or relatively well known, there are some Islamic traditions that say, well, his original name was Kutam, or his uh, was it, his, his uncle wanted to call him Kutam, and then his mother got a revelation herself that his name should be Muhammad. And see, you have to think about that for a moment. If uh, nowadays there's no trace of that, if you read the standard biographies of Muhammad, uh, Yasser Qadi has a biography of Muhammad out. Omid Safi wrote one recently. Tariq Ramadan has one. Uh, and if you read those. Nobody says a word, Karen Armstrong, nobody says a word in any of the popular biographies of Muhammad today about Kutam and that he had another name. And if you think about that, it's very strange because you have to ask yourself, if there was a, 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 if, if there was a person who was born, who was named Muhammad, who grew up to be the prophet of Islam, why would anybody, you know, Muslims will dismiss this if you challenge them about it and say, oh, well, that's just a weak hadith or a false story. But why would anybody invent it? What's the point? The only thing that makes sense of it, the only way that you can understand why there would be any story anywhere saying Muhammad had a different name is if there were stories about a Kutam 
that are now part of the story of Muhammad. And so people were asking, well, why is it that we're hearing that this was Muhammad when earlier we heard that this was Kutam who did this, whatever it was? And okay. so the story is made up that you have two different you 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 have two different names for the same person. The only explanation, the only I submit this to anybody, Farid, if you're out there, Muhammad Hijab, any of you, answer this. How could you possibly explain that he had this other name first and then he became Muhammad? And nobody mentions this nowadays at all in any way. How can you possibly explain it other than by saying that there were traditions of this other person that were folded into his own legend? Okay. So you are looking at the Islamic tradition and you are coming across with two different names and then uh, one name kind of get lost and then it's all identified as Muhammad. But there is yeah. nothing wrong that Allah or early Muslims sh become shamed of Muhammad's previous name and then they start using name of Muhammad forever. Sometimes well, maybe they are, because sometimes. they never use it now. Um, but uh, what is your view on um, location of his birth? So what does, do we have anything in Islamic tradition kind of contradicts or Islamic tradition agrees that Muhammad was born in a place called Mecca? Yeah, generally agrees that he was born in Mecca, except Mecca didn't exist okay. in the 7th century. <laughs> and so, you, the, you know, we have, for example, the records of tradesmen. And Patricia Crona did this, the research on this, groundbreaking research several decades ago, that uh, the tradesmen would keep the traveling salesmen, as we would call them today, they would travel between Europe and India on the Spice Road, and they would keep records of where they sold their goods, as any, as any salesman would, because you want to go back to the same place and sell more. And they never went to Mecca. It was not the busy trade city that it's represented as being in the sources. And if you look at the map of Arabia, it's in the southwest. You have to cross trackless desert waste to get there. So why would anybody do that when you could just make a straight shot out from Constantinople to Damascus and then further east? Why would you dip down into the, the burning sands of Arabia to get to this place? And... It, Nobody ever mentions going there until much later. Okay, Listen, so that, real quick, let's take that one step further. What does Patricia Crone do next? She then says, "Well, maybe it could be. Maybe they, we've just lost those documents. Maybe they uh, there there was a problem with them. So let's see if we can find references to the other incidental places that are in the same area." So she went to look for. Uh, she went to look for Sana, and she went to look for uh, uh, for Taif and Yathrib and. Tabuk and Khaybar and Petra. These are also very incident in the same area. And she found reference after reference for every one of these. Why is it that these incident places like Taif that has nothing more than a little hamlet, a place like Yathrib that only had 200 people, these are oasis on the Western Plateau. How can she could find references to all of those, yet not one reference in any of, of any, unless she, she did just go to of one group of references. She went to the Himyarites in the south. She went to the Nubians across the Red Sea. She went to the Nabataeans in the north. She went to the Assyrians, the Romans. She went to the Persians. She went to every civilization that surrounded Mecca and asked this question. Have you, can you give me one reference? And she went from the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth century all the way up into the eighth century. Now, remember, this woman reads and writes 15 languages. So she went to the original text in every one of these and could not find one reference in all that time to a place called Mecca. Yet all these other incidental places she found many references to. What does that tell you? Yep. So, um, okay, because I'm looking from evangelist perspective, okay? Yeah. I'm just trying to make sense of it. So Robert Spencer is telling me, Early Muslims are introducing two different names for so-called Muhammad, Prophet of Islam. And we don't have the place called Mecca. Uh, I think we can conclude that as Allah knows best what happened. Who, who is this Muhammad? What is all happened? And Jay is saying oh, Mecca was not there, but other places were okay. So there is a historical problem with the Mecca. Jay, what is your view on... Uh, man called Muhammad to be born in 570. 
absolutely mm-hmm. didn't, it didn't exist because the what you the only reason you can say 570 and the only reason you even come up with that reference is from traditions that are not even from the ninth century we thought they were from the ninth century stipulate and redacted back 200 years though that tradition that says he was born in 570 is from the 11th century and we're not even sure because no one's done a doctoral thesis to know whether that reference is in the 1053 document that might could be from the 14th or the 15th so we're talking about anywhere from 400 to 800 years later so tell me give me some reference from the 7th century that he was born in 570 that's all i'm asking so when anybody wants to debate me on this the first question i'll ask them is don't waste my time with the sera or the hadith or the tafsir or the tahri that don't even begin to appear to the 11th century i want you to prove to me that there was a place called mecca and there was a man called mahmud I'm saying Muhammad, not Muhammad. I think you guys are wrong by putting the word Muhammad there. The man named Muhammad, that far south, that lived anywhere near that place or that had anything to do with the book called the Quran or that started a religion called Islam. Bingo. Right. Do you see why this is, it puts them on the defensive? And from an evangelistic standpoint, Hatun, once you have done that, you're now in charge of the debate. They aren't. And therefore, you can then demand, you're not answering my question yet. You're you're whiff offing around, you're quoting material that's 400 to 800 years old. I'm asked it again. Let me repeat it. Show me somebody named Muhammad or even Mahmud that is that far south who received a book of the Quran in the mid 7th century. There you go. And the, by, by doing that, we control the debate evangelistically because the same question was asked of Jesus Christ. We had to prove that Jesus existed in the first century. We had to prove that there was a city called Jerusalem. We had to prove that these these gospel accounts, uh, these look at the hadith of Jesus, the sayings of Jesus from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We had to prove that they were legitimate and that they were authoritative. We had to prove that he died on the cross. If we had to do this, then why are not Muslim demand? Should we not demand the same of Islam? Absolutely. And and one other thing, if I may add, right from the book here. Uh, page 58, a 12th century account, 12th century Muslim account says the prophet is supposed to have been born that very year. That's 570, 50 days or two months after the departure of the elephant or even 10, 15 or even 20 years later. So you have an Islamic account from the 12th century that says Muhammad is supposed to have been born in 570 or 580 or 585. Or 590. Now, if Muhammad was born in 570 and everybody knew it, then why would anybody ever start to say? It's the same question I'm asking, I asked before about Kutam. Why would anybody start to say that he might have been born really in 580, 585, or 590? If, on the other hand, there was no agreement about when he was born and differing accounts that had to be reconciled, then you have people saying, this kind of variable statement. And so it only underscores that this is all myth and legend. It's not historical fact. And that brings the question of, are we sure Abraham and Ishmael didn't travel thousands of miles into the desert in order to build a little pile of bricks for no reason whatsoever? So that's- Tongue in cheek. Well done, T-Rex. Um, yes, we are sure he didn't <laughs> didn't do that. Yes. Um, okay, so um, there is a question on of his name, the dates, and the uh, birthplace where Muhammad was born. What about his first revelation? Well, uh, there again, the first where revelation. Did come from then, if uh, there is kind of problems with all of these things, or what well, else? It's the, it's the same situation again. As I, I show in the book, it's it's again and again and again with so many different stories. And one of the chief ones is the first revelation. You'll notice in the first place in Bukhari, you open up Bukhari, and the first page, after all the introductory material, the first hadith is the first revelation. And nowhere does it say that it's Gabriel. The angel is not identified by name. And then Ibn Sa'd, writing here again, as all these people are, writing much later, he says, in writing in the ninth century, and then we have the manuscripts from later, he says that it was Seraphel, the angel, and that after three years, he was replaced by Gabriel. Hmm. If, if, if Muhammad had had an encounter 
with the angel Gabriel in the cave on Mount Hira in 610 and had gone back into Mecca and preached that and explained it and, and described what happened to Khadija, to everybody else, why would anybody have come up with the idea that it was a different angel with a different name? Here again, it's the challenge to all the Islamic apologists. The only possible explanation for that is that there were accounts of somebody, maybe Kutam, encountering an angel, Sarafel, and that later those accounts were incorporated into the Muhammad legend. And so the two names had to be reconciled. Ibn Sa'd records traditions where Muhammad is first visited by Sarafel for three years, and then he's replaced by Gabriel. Completely, once again, dropped out of the uh, standard Islamic story. And if you read all the Islamic apologists' but lives, of, lives of Muhammad, they never will mention Sarafel, but he's in the Islamic traditions. And, and so there's no explanation. Then the question comes, uh, Muslims would tell me that Angel Gabriel uh, passed on the revelation to Muhammad and then Muhammad passed what he received to the, his companions and then they put the Quran together. So who put the Quran together in that account? Or if it wasn't the Angel Gabriel, how did Quran came to be? Well, let me give you uh, one little another little Islamic tradition that doesn't make any sense according to the standard story. And this is a, 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 a hadith in which an old man is quoted, not named, and he says, we never read the Quran in the mosques until the time of Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. Hajjaj ibn Yusuf being the governor of Iraq around the time of Abdul Malik at the end of the 7th century. So that's 60 years after Muhammad is supposed to have died, 60 plus, 60 to 70. Why is it if they had the Quran, if Muhammad had, if the Quran was complete by 632, and then Uthman collects it all together in 653, and it's distributed to all the Muslims, why is it that 40 years later they're still not reading it in the mosques? It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And why would anybody make up a story like that if because the apologists will just dismiss it as an inauthentic story, why would anybody make that up unless there were significant numbers of the mosques where the Quran was not being read? Here again, the only explanation is the Quran didn't exist, which also is abetted by the fact that you they, the story of the origins of the Quran is duplicated in Islamic tradition. You first have it that Zayd ibn Tabit collected the Quran together under the during the reign of, of Abu Bakr, and you have many of the elements of the same story coming up later when it happens under Uthman. And it's, he, he, for some reason, he picks exactly the same guy to collect it together, Zayd ibn Tabit, but he never remembers that he did this job already. And even Zayd has forgotten that he did it because he doesn't go to uh, Uthman and say, hey, you know, actually 20 years ago, uh, Abu Bakr asked me to do this. And so I happen to have the Quran right here. He, he starts the work again and does it again. And clearly, this is just the same story that is retold in equally valid, valid according to the way that Islamic scholars judge the value of Hadith. They have the same story duplicated because it was just a story that was circulating to explain the origins of the Quran and attributed to two different people at two different times. Uh, and I've got lots of, uh, that's all in the book. I've got lots of other stories like that where you have practically the same thing happening twice. Like uh, there's a story about Muhammad, you know, it's a funny thing. Uh, I recently encountered the Islamic scholar, Eric Ormsby, writing about how the Hadith depict Muhammad as so charming because there are stories where he laughs so heartily that you can see his back teeth. And so we're supposed to think, wasn't Muhammad a great guy? Or isn't it wonderful how he's depicted? When actually those stories are chilling, because Muhammad only laughs to display his back teeth when the his crack archer, Saad ibn Abi Waqqas, kills a Quraysh warrior with an arrow that he shoots but there, this is supposed to have happened during the Battle of Uhud, and then it happens during the Battle of the Trench. And um, in both cases, there's a there's a Quraysh warrior 
who is taunting the Muslims. And Saad ibn Abi Waqqas happens to be standing right next to, to Muhammad, and he shoots the guy after he's taunting oh. him so that the guy gets his comeuppance right there, and Muhammad laughs. So it's not charming. It's evil. But also, it's the same story duplicated twice. Did it happen at Uhud or at the Trench? And you have them both in the Hadiths. These are the all this is evidence that the we're not dealing with historical accounts here. We're dealing with fictional stories that like folk songs nowadays, you know, uh, you have somebody sings a folk song and somebody else, he doesn't quite remember the words. And so he changes them a little bit when he sings it. And you end up with two versions of the same song. It's like that. You get all these different versions of the material because it's all just myths and legends. Okay. Uh Jay, where do you stand then? So Robert is talking about how uh, First Revelation is very kind of contradictory uh, versions of it. And even when you go to the ninth century, still there are lots of contradiction of customs of Muhammad. Um, if there is even question of very basics of Quran came to Muhammad through angel Gabriel, then uh, who, who put Quran together? Where did it come from? Okay, now we're talking about the Quran. Now you're looking, you're doing, you're changing, you're changing uh, the, the 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 story here. The Quran, I think, we need to separate from the traditions of Muhammad. I think we need to keep them separate because we are talking about two different genres. If you're talking about the Quran, then you need to look at the manuscript evidence we have for them, and the manuscript evidence is as bad, if not worse, than what we're talking about for the I, traditions. Yeah, the, I guess I'm thinking in a sense of if Angel Gabriel didn't bring the Quran to Muhammad. Where did it come from? Well, obviously, it had to come from other sources, and we know exactly where the other sources is. If it really had come from Angel Gabriel, there would be there would not be all these contradictions in the Quran. If it really did come from the Angel Gabriel, there would not be stories that don't begin and don't end. Notice, none of the stories begin or end. They're all ulta pulta all over the place. There is only one complete story in the entire Quran. Why would the Angel Gabriel make such a mistake? And what kind of book that's in heaven would be that hopeless a book? It is an absolute disaster when it comes to literature. There's nothing as poorly written as the Quran itself in any language. I don't care what it is. However, however, what's interesting is if you have to put together a book hurriedly and you don't have any place to go to but to other sources and you have to borrow right, left and center and you have to go to Hebraic texts from the Jews and you have to go to Sire Aramaic texts and, and uh, Aramaic texts from the Christians and you have to go to, to Zoroastrian texts from the Zoroastrian, Ethiopic texts, even Chinese texts. If you're going to borrow from all that, that exists there, of which the Quran is full of, the Quran is full of these borrowings. So when you say who put it together, I would say it was put together over a long period of time because they had to borrow that which already existed. You have to, and the question you should ask is, why did they need a Quran? Why did they need a book? Look and see who they were. These were Ishmaelites. All of these were Ishmaelites. The Nabataean kingdom was the Ishmaelite. The Umayyad dynasty were Ishmaelites. And look and see what John of Damascus is. This is why I love John of Damascus. He was right there as an eyewitness as to what was going on. He was there in Abdul Malik's court from 685 to 705. His father was there in Mu'awiyah's court. So they were both he and his father were Byzantine uh, monophysite Christians watching what was going on amongst the Ishmaelites. When it comes to Abdul Malik, you then see a change that's happening. You see an, uh, an attack against Byzantine Trinitarian Christianity. You see a, a real attack coming with... That's why you see it on the Dome of the Rock. Uh, uh, Robert talks about that in his book. He talks about the Dome of the Rock. Look at those inscriptions. They're all attacking Jesus' divinity. They're attacking the Trinity. They're attacking his sonship. And then they say, La ilaha illa Muhammad. They don't say Muhammad. Why are we saying Muhammad? There's no vowels there. Look at this is continental text. It's just four letters. Mimha Mimdal. This Mimha Mimdal is nothing more than the servant. The, he is nothing more than the, the, the witness of Allah. He is nothing more than the, uh, the one who brings. He is the, the, uh, the one who is the servant of God. Isn't that interesting that the whole Shahada is presaged on a reference to somebody that has nothing to do with a person called Muhammad? That word, that name, comes much, much later. Once you start getting the vowels, and once you start introducing vowels, you can get to that. Now, here's the interesting, fascinating thing. 
if there is a need for these Ishmaelites to have their own text and their own prophet, because remember, they are they trace their lineage back to Abraham, just like the Jews and the Christians trace their lineage back to Abraham. They all go back to Abraham, though, through two different sons, one through Ishmael, the other through uh, the other through Isaac. You notice what Robert's been doing all the way through. Have you noticed in his book, he keeps on saying these aren't called Muslims. They call themselves Hagarians from Hagar. They call themselves Ishmaelites from Ishmael. They call themselves Muhajiruns, people of the Hijar, people of the uh, of, of Hagar again. And they call them Hagres. Magres, now he puts it the, the immigrants, people who are moving from one place to another. They never refer to themselves as Muslims. Isn't that interesting? But most of the terms they give to themselves show where their lineage is. They are in the line of Ishmael. They now have the greatest swath of land. They now control from Turkey in the north all the way to Yemen in the south. From Now, by the time that Abdel Malik comes to power, it's from Spain in the west all the way to India in the east. Their only other competition, their only other threat are Byzantine Christianity. The Byzantine Christians are not only their threat politically, they're also their threat theologically. Because they go through Isaac back to Abraham, whereas the Ishmaelites go through Ishmael back to Abraham. Now, here the Christians and Jews, who are their cousins, they have a prophetic line and they have a scripture. The Ishmaelites don't have a prophetic line. And they don't have a scripture, but they have all the land in the world. And guess what they have in that land? They've got the holy place. They've got Jerusalem. Now do you understand why Abdul Malik had to build the Dome of the Rock? And look when, where he built it. He built it where the Mahmud was to return. You know who the Mahmud is? Take a look. Now, Robert refers to him. The Mahmud, look at Ambrose. In the fourth century, Ambrose, the father, says clearly that the Mahmud is the anointed one, the praised one, the Messiah. From that time on, you have church father after church father referring to the Mahmud. Oregon refers to him. Uh, St. Gregory of Alvira in 392 refers to him, the late 4th century. St. John of Cassian refers to the Mahmud, the Mahmud, the Messiah, the person of Jesus who is to come again a second time. St. Augustine in 430, in the 5th century, refers to the Mahmud. Aponius, in the 7th century, refers to Mahmud. They're all referring to this Mahmud, who is the Messiah, who the Christians and Jews know is going to come back, return a second time. While that's happening, you have the Jews who also are referring to Mahmud, and they're referring to him as the Messiah who is yet to come. They're waiting for him to come the first time. We're waiting for him to come the second time. Where is the Mahmud? Where is the Messiah going to return? He's going to return to the Temple Mount. They're in Jerusalem, Mount Moriah. That's why Abdul Malik built that building there. And that's why when you look at the inner ambulatories, the only original part of the building that still exists today, when you look at the inscriptions, as Robert says in his book, they're all attacking Jesus and his divinity and the Trinity and his sonship. And then introduces that there is only one God but God. And the praised one or the anointed one is nothing more than the messenger of God. Now, isn't that interesting when you look? No, remember what Robert also said in his book? He talks about the four references to Muhammad. I'm going to keep saying Muhammad, not Muhammad. Robert, I hope you, you need to change that in your next printing. Take Muhammad out of there and put Muhammad where it belongs. Because there was no vowels that early when that was written. Are you following me? Look at the oh, earliest. Absolutely. Look at the earliest manuscripts of the Quran. There is nothing called Muhammad in those four, te those four texts. Those are all M Mim Ha Mim Dal. And we've got to keep it to that because we're we're imposing our view, the name Muhammad, onto those texts. Well, there goes the there, look at it, even my computer likes that. It's this old <laughs> fireworks behind me. Can you see why we may, we may, we need to go back to the seventh century and the eighth century and we need to read the words as they are? Once you see the word if that it's just these four letters, then you can say, of course, everybody's waiting for the Mahmud, the Jews for, to come the first time, the Christians to come a second time. The Ishmaelites don't have a Mahmud, so therefore they have to create a Mahmud. Okay. They have to create what everybody's waiting for. No wonder Abdul Malik puts it there on the Dome of the Rock, but he's still not a, uh, he's nothing more than an anti-Trinitarian Christian. This is really an, a really an internecine battle going on between the Trinitarians and the anti-Trinitarians. Why are we surprised? This happened in the fourth century. Arianism. 
had a, was a, an, a, a, was a, well, we call it Arianism after him. He was an anti-Trinitarian. Athanasius was commissioned to confront anti-Trinitarianism and at the Council of Nicaea. So this has been going on since the fourth, fifth, sixth. Why are we surprised it's not raising its head in the seventh century? Someone a little earlier in one of your comments, Hatun, said, is this not a heresy or is this a sect of Christianity? That's exactly what this is. This is a heresy of Christianity. And that's why John of Damascus is so important because he was right there watching this happen. He was there. Uh, he was a witness, a testimony to this going on right there in the courts of Abdel Malik there in Damascus. But he doesn't say anything. He dare not say anything because he's a Trinitarian. That's why when he goes and he finally leaves his uh, his job and he goes to the monastery, he then writes his greatest masterpiece. Look at the title of the masterpiece. It's right there. It's, it's so clear. The heresy of the Ishmaelites. That's exactly what he's saying. He's been trying to say that. He's trying to tell us this is a heresy. In order to have a heresy, you have to have a heresy of something. Obviously, it's a heresy of Christianity. It's an anti-Trinitarian heresy. And then he names four books. Isn't it interesting? There's not one Quran. In, and this is written in 730. This is well into the 8th century. So here you have John of Damascus referring to the book called the, uh, the, the Cow. That's now become chapter 2 of the Quran. The book of the women. That's now come, become chapter 4 in the Quran. The book of the table. That's become chapter 5 in the Quran. And the book of the camel, which there is no chapter. Obviously, these are four other books that, are, that will then morph into the Quran at a much later date. Which fits the manuscript evidence of the Quran itself, Katun. Okay. That's exactly what we're finding in the manuscript evidence. So we should not be surprised that none of the earliest Qurans in the 8th and in, going into the ninth century are complete. Nor are they, nor has anybody looked to see which of these two, four, five, and, and of course the one that doesn't exist, when were they introduced into the Quran and when was the auxiliary material introduced at that period? I mean, here's a doctor to be done right here. This is why we need to bring the Quranic material along with the material on Mecca and of course this material on Muhammad all together in one feed. Because what you're finding is that uh, they all fit to the same place. They're all saying the same story. Okay, I so got we've got, oh, sorry. Um, go ahead, Robert. Well, I just wanted to add a couple things because that's very important points Jay's made. And just to emphasize a couple of things in them, uh, as far as John of Damascus goes, uh, he, he's quoted in, in, in the Muhammad, the critical biography. Uh, I wanted to point out that he says that Muhammad composed many frivolous tales to each of which he assigned a name. And that's when he mentions, as Jay said, the text of the woman, the cow, the table, and the camel of Allah. Now, the woman, the cow, and the table, as Jay mentioned, are the parts of the Quran, chapters of the Quran now, and the camel is not. Mm -hmm. But John gives no indication that they're all one book. That's He's right. writing about them as if they are four different books. And three of them are in the Quran now, and one of them isn't. So... Look at the date, 730. We're talking a good hundred years after Muhammad, if he even lived, died. And so it seems as if it's reasonable to surmise that at the 100 years after Muhammad is supposed to have died, John of Damascus does not have the Quran as we know it today, yeah. and that it did not exist as we know it today. Otherwise, you don't take the chapters of a book and act as if they're separate books. Nobody would do that now. Yeah. And the only explanation for his talking about this, just as the only explanation for Kutam and Sarafel and all the rest of it, is that these were not one book at the time that John's writing. Some of them made it into the Quran and some of them didn't. Or maybe the camel material made it into the Quran under another name or distributed in various places because there are stories, very strange elliptical stories, that never make any sense about a camel of Allah several times in the Quran, but it's not a particular chapter of its own. Now, just one thing, and then I'll, 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 I'll be quiet. The uh, Dome of the Rock also, very important. And as Jay noted, it's a Christian place. And it seems to have been an anti-Trinitarian Christian church to begin with. And the inscriptions bear this out, because this is the first time that we get the statement, uh, Muhammad is the servant of Allah and his messenger and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. But that's all it says about Muhammad. You would think that when you have a statement written on the wall 
of this holy place that it says Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, that if you read on, it's going to be about Muhammad or Allah. It's not. The rest of it is about Jesus. Every bit of it going on and on and on after, after it says Muhammad is the messenger of Allah is about Jesus. Robert, can I just ask one question? Where does it say Muhammad on the Dome of the Rock? It's in the uh, it's in the inscriptions where it says the. I mean, it's M H M D. Yes. There you go. It's not yes. Muhammad. You're doing this. You're playing the same game, and I'm going to hang you on this. Would you stop calling it Muhammad? <laughs> well, you're, I'm, I'm you're doing using no. a 21st century reading onto a seventh century text when it's not even there. That's an entirely reasonable point, but also we have to make sure that what we're saying is understandable. Yeah. At the same time, time. you're and assuming so, is that is Muhammad. People hearing yeah. you will say, "Ah, you're talking. See, Muhammad's there when he was not there. He well, is the actually." Muhammad. My point is just the opposite. My point is that it wouldn't make any sense to have a long inscription where you mention one person and then, without any explanation and without any sign of transition, you go on in the rest of the lengthy statement to talk about somebody else. Yeah, there you and go. So yeah. it's it's very clear that the MHMD or Muhammad, Muhammad as the messenger of Allah, as mentioned in the Dome of the Rock inscription, is not referring to the prophet of Islam. Most likely referring to Jesus, since the rest of the statement is about Jesus. And you say that on page 24 of your book. And I, I right. thank you for doing that. You really pinpoint that chapter 47, there are only four references to Muhammad, not Muhammad, to Muhammad in the Quran. And yeah. what you say very clearly in chapter 47 to look and see what he says. This Muhammad is a messenger. Now, who else is the messenger in the Quran? Chapter 5, verse 75. It is Jesus that's the messenger. So yeah. it must be the same person. So yeah. that. Chapter 47, verse 2, chapter 48, verse 29, as you so well say, are both about Jesus. I would ask chapter, I would add, uh, um, also apply to that, chapter 3, verse 144, and chapter 33, verse 40, are also about Jesus. They're all four about Jesus Christ. Okay. So, the, the thing is that the messenger is mentioned multiple times in the Quran, but not named. And people assume, and as a matter of fact, English translations of the Quran abet this misimpression because they put in parentheses Muhammad, or sometimes they don't even put parentheses. So people think Muhammad is mentioned multiple times in the Quran, and he isn't. They, they, they're talking about the messenger. Look at what it says in chapter 5, verse 75. The Messiah, Issa, son of Miriam, was no more than a messenger. So who is the one that is the messenger in the Quran? There you go. Kindle. It's Jesus. Okay, so... Um... John of Damascus is talking about, so that I understand, um, John of Damascus is talking about four different books and then three of them are entered into the Quran as chapter. I think I know why fourth book or fourth chapter John of Damascus is mentioning is not there because there was a table. They put all the books on this table and then table is being shaken. Table is being shaken and the book of camel just fallen and then um, a cow, um, woman um, and table end up in the Quran and then sadly uh, book of camel didn't end up. Isn't that, isn't that, um, isn't that, that, that famous. That's what, about, they, that's what they say about the Bible. <laughs> the Bible accounts in Nicaea, they put all 200 books and they shook them, and the one that le was left over, the 27 books that we have today, that was Ahmadidat, I think, that made that popular. That's yeah. crazy. I am not surprised to uh, say uh, Dome of the Rock is focus, focus of Jesus or focus of Christian faith, in a sense. Islam is very polemical religion. So, uh, only good news Islam has is other religions are false is the reasons. Islam doesn't have good news for itself and um, they are quite good at being polemical. So therefore they put polemical statement or it's been translated as... I should take that one step further. Take that one step further. Look who rails the Dome of the Rock. It's Abdul Malik, right? 
His biggest threat are Byzantine Christianity, but Byzantine Trinitarian Christianity, they are most not only a political threat, but they're also a theological threat. So by building it right there on Mount Moriah, where the Messiah, where the Mahmud is going to return to, both Jews and Christians believe he's going to return to Mount Moriah. He builds it right there, looking down over the Church of the Sepulchre. So that's where the pilgrims come from, to, uh, for the Christian pilgrims. This is not only a Christian polemic, it's an anti-Trinitarian Christian polemic against the Trinity. It's also a political polemic. So you can see both coming and going. He's doing two things simultaneously, which is very clever. That's why, oh, there go the balloons. That's why this is not down in Mecca, nor is it up in Damascus. It's right where it needs to be. And no one's picking up on that. And we've got to emphasize that point. He had to build that there. He had to put those inscriptions there because this is an attack against Jesus. It's attack. That's why it's not Islam yet. This is still not Islam. This is nothing more, nothing more than a sectarian dispute between Trinitarians and anti-Trinitarians, which still exists today. Who do you think the Jehovah Witnesses are? Bingo. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I think your video is kind of giving up these balloons and then celebration things because your I, I love them when I get it when I get excited I'm sorry about that no no it's absolutely fine it's just not because of you because your camera is Islamophobe Jay that's the main reason for that I've got an Islamophobic computer look at that yeah uh, okay but notice so that Hajjaj that I mentioned earlier and the old man saying we never read the Quran until the time of Hajjaj he was a contemporary of Abdul Malik he was an associate of Abdul Malik. He was Abdul Malik's lieutenant in, in the Iraq region. And this is when is, we start to see the beginnings of Islam as we know it today. As But as Jay said, it wasn't even close to being Islam yet. But yet. this is Not when yet. we start to find, we start to get a differentiated religious tradition and the appropriation of this early material to create the Quran and all the stories about Muhammad. Okay, now, Robert, take that one step further. If you start with a book and you now have the man, you now are appointing this as the Mahmud. This is the Mahmud that everybody's waiting for. You now have the Mahmud, right? What do you need next? You need to put him in a place. Not only that, then you need to give him a backstory. Now can you see why it takes 70 to 100 years to get that backstory correct? But there have been revisions after revisions after revisions. And remember, we're told this. We're told that al-Buhari was given 600,000 of these akbars. And he threw out 98% of them, only retained 2%, only 7,367. Even Muslims tell us that this was going on. That was the Abbasids destroying all the Umayyad documentation. That continues right up into the Ottoman, Ottoman period. Because almost all these extant documents that we're looking at now are from the Ottoman period. So it takes them another 400 to 500 to 600 years to finally get the story right, that you finally got the biography right by the 16th century, not written up until the 19th century by a German. Why did it take a German to write that up? Why didn't the Muslims write that up long before that? Because there was no agreement on which document they're going to use. There were so many, there were so many competing stories. That's why the good old good old Wistenfeld put it together and gave him and, and did the job for them. But that to me shows all the more reason why when Muslims today say they know who Muhammad is, they know what his story is, they know what he said, they have no idea just how late that story was put together or how late what he said was put together. And they are not aware of just how weak their argument is. Well, that's why they need to read the book, because it's all in here, including the lateness of the material, but also the variations on so much of it. Like people take for granted that Muhammad was 23 years, 13 in Mecca, and then 10 in Medina. Even that is controverted in the traditions. And there's no agreement. There's general agreement that it was 10 years in both. But there's all kinds of variation as to what he was doing the other three years. And some so, say he was in Mecca. Some say he was in Medina. Some say that he was somewhere else altogether or that he was silent for three years and then started to preach. And uh, these things are just more, more confirmation of what you're saying. Well, they stole that part from Paul when Paul was like, taking time to kind exactly, of... Exactly, exactly. So... Uh, if, before we get off this, can I just make one more point um, on what Robert's saying? And, um, you know, many people say that, you know, they always claim that everything that we're dependent on is for much, much, much later redacted back. That's the claim that's always made about the person of Jesus Christ. What we're finding here is just the opposite. You notice we, all, we also have in Christianity, we have 
the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Judas. We have the Gospel of Barnabas. You have all these supposed Gospels written by people that either were disciples of Jesus or were friends, like Barnabas, a friends of Paul, that are that that, that the early church threw out. And the reason they threw them out was because not only because of the material that was in them completely confronted and contradicted what was in the gospel account, but the primary reason is that they were all written so late. Therefore, since they were written so late, they were written by people who put the name of Thomas or Judas or uh, Barnabas so that they would give authority to them. And hopefully people will believe that these were actually from those individuals. We, the church, threw them out and we don't use them anymore and we have never used them. Look what we're, we're noticing here. The earliest material on Muhammad just does not exist. But what is the what is the material that they're retaining? What is the material that the Muslims are dependent on? The Sirah, the Hadith, the Tafsir, the Tahrir, the Sabi, Sab, Sahaba, and the Tabiun. All of that is 11th, 12th, third, the most, the most, the oldest material that existed is what they're considering to be the, the best material, which is just the opposite of what we do in Christianity. And whenever you ask uh, his, the historical question, when anybody, one person does something in a history at a certain time, at a certain place, what's the first thing you demand of that? You want eyewitness account. Am I correct? It's just like what police need whenever there's an accident. They put a sign up there and they say this accident happened at this date, at this time. If you were here, if you saw it with your own eyes, please call this number. They do that today. That's called forensic testing. And we demand that. We demanded that of Jesus Christ. It was demanded of us that we find eyewitness accounts of what Jesus did, who he was, what he said. And we do. We have eyewitness accounts, John and Matthew. We got. We also have Tabun account, which is the second generation. That would be Luke, uh, Luke and Mark. But we also... Because of the fact that we, we we made sure that those people who wrote about Jesus, what he said and did, were from that time period, not hundreds of years later, and from the same area, not thousands of miles further north. All of that was demanded of us, and we were the and we were able then to find that to be able to show that Jesus is historical. What he said and what he did, we can trust. Muslims have the same the same. The, the demand that we must put on them. They are to do the same thing that we've had to do with Jesus Christ. They must now find references to this man named Muhammad in the seventh century, doing what he did, saying what he said in the place that it happened. That I don't know how they're going to do that. Thank God we don't have to defend Muhammad. I'm so glad that that's not something that I have to prove, but isn't it great that we can do that with Jesus Christ? Yeah. And it's, it's really astonishing because when you look at the historical record, we not only have the New Testament, but as I mentioned before, we have the Apostolic Fathers, the disciple, the Ignatius of Antioch, the disciple of St. John, the uh, Clement of Rome, who was a disciple of Peter, and they write, they quote the Gospels. This is in the early second century or the late first century. So take that out to the seventh century and try to find, say, a follower of Umar, or Uthman, or any one of the uh, companions, and you don't find anybody talking this way. Or if you do find it produced, then when you look, you say, oh, actually, this is a ninth century record. You know, <laughs> like the, the famous story of uh, Sophronius, the Patriarch of Jerusalem, taking the Caliph Umar around uh, the city after the conquest of Jerusalem. And then you read the actual writings of Sophronius, there's no mention of Umar or Muslims or Islam. It's just that the, the, the Saracens came out of the desert and laid waste. And so it's all just, uh, there's no analogy whatsoever to the origins of Christianity where the attestation of the life of Jesus and the ministry of Jesus and the whole New Testament is so much stronger than that of the Quran. There you go. And Islam. So, just quick addition. So Luke and Mark will be still the first generation for the gospel accounts. Um, so I remember, Jay, I don't know if you remember, you've got actually be better memory than me. Remember at Speaker's Corner, we would use the same hadiths, let's say same Sahih Bukhari hadiths with the different version of the same story. And um, even today, when you kind of talk to the Muslims, they reject one of the story and then they say, oh no, there is, you've got the, what about this Sahih Bukhari? It's similar story, but like, um, the details which you are focusing is a little bit different. So there is a contradiction within Sahih Bukhari tradition or within Islamic tradition. And then we've got this amazing um, contradiction between Sunni and Shia uh, accounts 
even Sunnis and Shias do not agree regarding uh, what Muhammad said, what Muhammad did. And now Robert Spencer is bringing other Islamic sources. All of them are disagreeing with very basics. <laughs> then I guess the question would be, what would be the motivation or the reason for someone even to decide in 8th century, 9th century to put together biography for Muhammad or decided to write, write down the customs of Muhammad? Why there is a need or what, what is the motivation for that? And I think Robert's really good at this, but let me go ahead and before and before and try to uh, try to say what I'll say, and then I'll give it over to Robert because he has some amazing. I mean, I've I've I've, I've actually worked with this on Robert, and he has some a great comeback on this. If you are creating a religion or a faith, a sect that is in contradistinction to the heresy that you're that you're trying to confront, as you're doing that. You, many times you're going to have disputes that happen within the group itself. And those disputes are going to create different sects within sects. This happens, it happens even today. And this happens within, within Christianity, it happens within Hinduism, it happens within every religion. There are sects that, that branch off. And as they con con confront each other, they then have to try to find a authority for their belief or their practice. The best way to find authority for your belief or practice is to hang it on the, the originator of your faith. That's why you, with the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Judas, the Gospel of Barnabas, they hung it on the names of people that were from that period, from that place, to give authority to it. Although they, like the Gospel of Barnabas, is written in 1643, the 17th century, by redacting it back to the originator, that gives you authority for what you're trying to say or a practice you're trying to impose. As these happen, of course, other groups come on even later that don't like what's gone before, and so they eradicate that and put their own traditions. And then they claim that these are the ones that belong to Muhammad. As long as you put Muhammad's there and give him the as the arbiter for this practice or that belief or that doctrine, then, of course, you get the authority for that. That now makes sense why so much of this is so late, why all of these are late. And all that has been destroyed are documents that, that, that predated that. What you can't destroy, however, are the coins and the rock inscriptions and, of course, the buildings. Those are the things that help us to know really what did happen in the 7th century. So why did they put these together? Why did they put? Why did they create the Hadith? Why did they create the Siddha? I would suggest to create a authority for the needs that they had at that time. Now you can understand why they're not even 9th and 10th century. These are 11th, 12th, 13th, up until the 15th century. So I'll, I would suggest much of this that we're finding out about what Muhammad said and did is not Umayyad. It's probably not even Abbasid. It looks like much of it is Ottoman. Well, you These know what's remarkable the about Ottoman that? Period. You know, the wild thing about the Umayyads and the Abbasids is that the Abbasids are famous for criticizing the Umayyads for irreligion. That yep. supposedly the Umayyads, which is the which is Muawiyah, it's Muawiyah was the caliph starting in 661, and it was his son who defeated the the son of Ali at Karbala in 680, and so you've got this guy who's at the foundation of Islam. Uh, uh, Aisha asked him during the caliphate of Ali to fight against Ali because she hated him because he had said went to when she was accused of adultery and Muhammad was all upset. He, Ali says, what are you so upset about? You can just get another woman. And uh, she heard him. This is all Islamic tradition. But in any case, the, the, the point is that Muawiyah and his family, that's a foundational family of Islam. And yet when the Abbasids supplant the Umayyads in the middle of the 8th century, they say the Umayyads were not religious enough. We are we are more religious. And here again, this doesn't make any sense that these people who uh, knew Muhammad, that they knew the Sahaba, they knew the basic, the, the foundational people at this at the basis of this religion, at least according to the traditional view, that they would be irreligious. Why, why would they be irreligious? They, they, they were right there at the beginning of this thing. They should be the most energized about it. But they're accused of irreligion. The only explanation, the only actual explanation, is that they were not irreligious at all. It's just that the religion did not exist yet. Mm -hmm. And that had to be explained. That as uh, uh, the Umayyads' lack of mention of Islam in their inscriptions and on their coins 
and in all the rest of it, it had to be explained away. And so the, the Abbasid had crosses and all their coins. Exactly. It's so, the wrong religion. It's the religion that they didn't want, the one that they're uh, confronting, and because they are a sect, a sect of that religion. So there had to be uh, uh, fabricated the idea that the Umayyads, for whatever reason, didn't really care about Islam, and that's why the Abbasids uh, supplanted them. But really, it's just that Islam had not yet been formulated. And so the, the, the irreligion of the Umayyads is just the, the, the fact of the absence of the religion. But I think in a larger sense, the best sense that can be made of this whole thing is that we're in an age, we're talking about an age when there were not governments, when there were not parliaments and constitutions and governments on an organized fashion of that kind. Every government was an autocracy centered around a monarch. And every government in the area that we're talking about had a religion. The Roman Empire, or the, what's known as the Byzantines, they were Christians, and Orthodox Christians. And the uh, Persians, the other power of the day, were Zoroastrians. And so the Arabs amassed this massive empire, and then they have to find a way to unify it and to solidify it and ensure that it will be strong against its enemies. So they create this religion, and not only do they make the religion, but they make it martial, aggressive, expansionist, and supremacist, because that's the kind of people they were. These are warriors who had amassed this massive empire. They want to, you know, they want to solidify it. The only way they know to do that is by force, by violence, by military means. So they sanctify those yeah. things in the religion. So am I right to um, just understand, uh, if I heard correctly, you are saying early Muslims who identify themselves as Muslims were fighting with others who were identifying themselves as Muslims. Oh, yeah. Well, that's very clear. But that's uh, uh, just a second. It, it's clear from the fact that there are 593,000 fabricated hadith that Bukhari rejected which is something that even Muslims admit, that these were created by one faction of the Muslims in order to support their own point of view. And then another group would create an, a, a different story that was might be completely contradictory to support their own point of view. Yeah, and I, it's all just... confusing people. You, you don't mean Muslim, Muslim at this early, do you? Well, when you're talking about Bukhari, yeah, earlier, no. No. Okay, so you're saying that the Bukhari would say these are Muslims against Muslims, but what's actually happening historically, no, they are disputes, but they're not Muslim against Muslim. Yeah. More likely, these are sectarian disputes. Yeah, absolutely. As the religion is being formulated, you have different factions who are supporting different perspectives on what this is all going to be about, or who come out of different traditions, uh, Aryan Christianity or any number of other things, and all this has to be consolidated. And so it was actually put all together, but the contradictions were not ironed out. And then yep. the whole Isnad business was, was created in order to provide a justification for rejecting some of this material. Just but there is great many contradictions in the material that's considered canonical anyway. Just for the clarification, when you say Isnad, what do you mean? The chain of transmitters, the 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 thing that's supposed to establish whether the hadith is authentic or not. Uh, the, that, names, the names when it says, I took this from this, I took this from this. I yes, that, yeah. that, that Aisha told this to uh, somebody else who told it to somebody else and five other names. And if all those people named are reliable, then it's considered authentic. And if they're not, then it's not. But of course, the Isnad chains can be forged just as much as the stories can. And so you put an authentic Isnad chain, whatever that may mean in your particular area or particular time, and <laughs> you circulate it in order to give the story authenticity. But the earliest Hadiths did not have the chain of transmitters at all. And later on, you have the same story with different transmitters, indicating that the chains of transmissions were themselves fabricated and altered in different <laughs> places at different times based on who was valued, who was considered to be a revered, respected figure, and who was not. 
Okay. This question that's come up by T Rex is very good, and uh, T Rex, thanks for for bringing these to the fore. Luxembourg, and you need to also put Gunther Luling's name in there yeah. because Gunther Luling is the one that really started this and paid the price for uh, daring to say that maybe much of the much of the original hymns, those beautiful poetry, are Christian hymns. And he was thrown into obscurity because of that. <laughs> Luxembourg uh, wisely didn't use his raid. That's not his real name. That's his pseudonym. <clears throat> but went much further than Gutter Luding to find that almost all the subtexts of this hid, these hidden passages of the Quran are hymns and lectionaries and uh, homilies all to Jesus Christ. One of the most <laughs> remarkable things about that is the mysterious letters. And Hatun yeah. and I were talking about this recently. <laughs> that, uh, the mysterious Luxembourg posits, and I think he's got a very good case that, and this is in my book, The Critical Quran, that the the mysterious letters they don't make any sense in any Islamic context, as even Muslims themselves admit. Only Allah knows the meaning of these letters, but they make sense if you think of them, think of the Quran as a Christian lectionary with disparate readings, which is why it jumps from one topic to another because it's readings for different times of the year. There it's not, go. it's not a coherent narrative. And so you are given directions as to where to go next, what to read next. If you've ever been in a liturgical church, I'm an Orthodox Christian myself, and if you've ever uh, sung, you know that you might be singing one hymn from one book and then switch to another book, and you have to know where you're going and what you're doing on a given day. And so it's the same thing that Luxembourg is saying you have in the Quran and the mysterious letters, the Alif, Lam, Mim, and so on that are at the beginning of so many chapters, they are directions for the liturgist to know where to go next in the lectionary and that that's why they don't make any sense on the face of it in the Quran. Okay. Um, they stole from us. Everything. According to Islam, their hands should be cut off, but we will let that go. Um, what Too are many your, hands. <laughs> yeah. What are your thoughts on this? Maybe John of Damascus around 730 AD hears four books. So that's we talked about um, camels. Um, chapter of camel or book of camel is not in the Quran. al Hajjaj put together in a full book in Kufa, 710, thousand miles away. So John of Damascus misses the full book by a handful of years as it begins to circulate. That's entirely possible. There's no reason why that wouldn't be so, but it's just all total speculation. Uh, the, the, but I think that there is a very important point here that has more to do with the Hadith than the Quran, that you could have Hadiths being accepted and circulating and considered authentic and a thousand miles away, other ones that are completely contradictory being circulating and being considered authentic and so on. And then once, uh, as time goes by, and as Jay has noted, you know, we're talking about getting into the Ottoman period. And even later, it, these things have to be standardized, and you have these collections, and this is why there's so much contradiction within the canonical collections. Um, any comments on this, Jay? Yeah, I'm just looking up real quickly, and maybe you can help me with his name. Who is the ninth century Isak, um, the, the Christian... Uh, in in the courts of Mamun, Ibn is not Ibn Isak. His name is Isak, but he is a Christian in the courts of Mamun. And there's this famous quote that has been around for centuries, and no one really understood it. Where he's remonstrating, and he's saying, "Now we're talking about the ninth century. Now that you, you Muslims who are still putting together, chopping and piecing together your holy book." And most people just dismiss this as the guy was either ranting or he just didn't understand what was happening. We now look today and say, hold on, here's another eyewitness, just like John of Damascus was an eyewitness. John of Damascus was watching this happen in the courts of Al uh, Abdul Malik in the, uh, the late 7th century. Here you have Isak, who's there as a Christian, watching the exact same thing happen, even as late as 820. We're talking about the 9th century, and he's seen that this book is still being put together. Yeah. The problem we're going to have is we don't know how to, 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 we still haven't been able, or no one really wants to take a position on dating the manuscripts that do exist. The six major manuscripts that we talked about since 2014, those are still been redated and redated and redated. If you look at this new book that's just come out by my good friend, I have it here somewhere, on the Tokapa manuscript. 
If you look at the top copy manuscript, and I don't see it in front of me at the moment, he is now saying that the top copy manuscript is not mid eighth uh, century. It may be ninth or tenth century. So we're 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 as we do more research, as they get more, uh, if they look at the paleography and the codicology of these Quranic manuscripts, we're going to start pushing these manuscripts even further and further back, which suggests, therefore, that we might be coming onto the same time period that we're talking about the traditions for the Quran itself. I think that uh, I actually discuss in the book that uh, the Quran might not have been in its final form at the time that the canonical Hadith were collected. Uh, I can't find it now where it is, but uh, I've got a tradition where it says that Gabriel himself gave the order of the, sur the, the surahs in the Quran, but it doesn't correspond to the order that we have today. And so why would the Muslims contradict what Gabriel himself told them about the ordering of the Quran? Unless, of course, this was a rival tradition that lost out and so on. But still, this is this is ninth century or later that the, the there seems to be controversy still over the ordering of the surahs in the Quran, indicating that even the Quran itself was not finalized by that Here. time. Here, I found the, the quote now. It's Al-Kindi. It's not Isaac. It's like Al-Kindi. The Christian polemicist in 830 said, The result of all this process by which the Quran came into being is patent to you who have read the scriptures and see how in your book, he's talking to Muslims here, histories are all jumbled together and intermingled, an evidence that many different hands have been at work therein and caused discrepancies, adding, cutting out whatever they like or dislike, are such now the conditions of a revelation sent down from heaven. So this was written in 830, well into the ninth century. Always has been, a, a, people, a, scholars have always questioned what's going on here. Well, now, as we realize, most of the earliest manuscripts are not from, uh, not even from the 8th, they may be ninth century. It looks like this was happening while Al-Kindi was right there as a, as an eyewitness to it. There you go. They, they just dated um, Topkapı Medina for um, 8th century, um, almost complete, just two um Two pages were teared down and then they edited it out, but that's the that's the latest one on top cup as well. Um, do you think that Surah 61 verse 6 is called Jesus coming back? Um MHMD becoming HMD, the praise one as returning the most praised. Well, it's referring to Ahmed as being the one who's coming back. So I'm not sure I understand the question. Maybe uh uh, are you saying? Are you suggesting that it originally referred to Jesus coming back? It's entirely possible, but I don't know of any manuscript that, uh, that well, says such a thing. Jay might. If you keep this as Mahmud, then this would fit right in with what the what the Christians believe. And if this ah, is part. Yes and put into the Quran, then why are we surprised? Of course he's the one coming back. The Muppet is returning. That's what Ambrose said. That's what Oregon said. That's what Gregory said. That's what John Cassian said. That St. Augustine, they all said this. Why are we surprised? That the, if you're going to borrow and put it in the Quran, for heaven's sakes, get the right name and make sure that you give give credit to whoever who was the one that wrote it. So this would make sense. The praised one, the anointed one, is coming back again. His name is Jesus. Um. Okay, so we are almost um, an hour and a Which now means we're going to have to redo chapter 61 6 all over again in our different in our argumentation and say actually the Quran is actually correct. But isn't it interesting how we're finding out the Quran is correct on so many one of so many of these points, like on chapter 6, verse 164, and also chapter 3, verse 38 on atonement? Actually, the Quran gets it right. Someone who is a bearer of sins cannot bear the sins of another. The only one who doesn't bear sins can bear the sins of another. Well, isn't that what we've been saying? And where do you think that, where, if it's in the Quran, where do you think it came from? It came right out of the Bible, for heaven's sakes. It's, it's just We're just exposing and showing that so much as this has been borrowed. Uh, but the Muslims perverted it along the way with um, uh, with their dots and vowels. Yep. Need to bring it home. Um, okay, so sad news is um, there are lots of other things I want to ask and I want to go through. Uh, book is only 340 pages. Sorry, I, I didn't mean like only as a negative, like the book is 330, <laughs> 340 pages and there are lots of other things I wanted to go. But we Actually, are reaching... that's a great way to say it. It's only, I wish it was a thousand pages is what you really wanted to say. There's such good material in this book. Yeah. Therefore, people buy this book. It is loaded with material and there's going to be huge discussions, I think, from here on out. Thank you so much.
Robert, for what you have done. You've been a blessing to us. You've been a blessing to the church. You're actually a blessing to Muslims because you're actually doing what Muslims should have done. They should have done this. Why haven't they done what you have done? Why haven't they done this historical critique? Why aren't they looking at their their traditions with their prophet and asking the question you have asked? Since that should be done by every religion, we had to do that with Jesus. Uh, we're going to demand that the Hindus do that with the Upanishads and the Vedas, and the uh, and they, we're going to ask the Sikhs to do that with with the Granth Sahib. We've asked the Mor we've already demand the Mormons do that with the Book of Mormon. For heaven's sakes, this is, should be the first thing that Muslims should have been doing. Since Christians did the work when they at, were asked to do so, we're now going to ask Muslims to do it. And if we're not going to do it, we're going to send Robert Mori on there uh, uh, on 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 them, sick Robert Mori on them, so he'll do the work for them. Robert Morey, I think he passed away. Robert Spencer, why do I call Morey? He's dead. Yes. Live. In any case, uh, I'm deeply honored. Thank you uh, by your words and thank uh, God above all. But the thing is, uh, I think it's astonishing to me that this is not being done for the most part in academic circles. Obviously, there are some very courageous academics who are at work in this, but for the most part, it's being done outside the institutions and the institutions are bought to a tremendous degree by Saudi Arabia and Qatar, and they are not doing these investigations. I saw recently an astonishing thing, I'm still surprised about it, where uh, there was a lecture about the validity of the manuscripts of the Bible and the validity of the manuscripts of the Quran. And to speak about the Bible, they had Bart Ehrman, the famous skeptical <laughs> scholar, who, who said, I don't know if he even believes that Jesus existed and so on. And for the Quran, they had an Islamic apologist yeah. who is, is, just a pre, is just doing dawah. And this is in an academic setting, but this is yeah. what passes for academic work. So people who are outside the academy, we have to do the work for them. Yeah. yeah. And thank you for doing that. Number 28, we can, we're, we're, we're waiting for another 28 to come. <laughs> So just, yeah, maybe maybe two. Okay, so um, I've got a couple of questions uh, before I let you go. One of the statistics shows that one of the main reasons that uh, Muslims become Christian is once their faith is being questioned, when once their faith is being challenged, mainly on the character of Muhammad then they choose to walk away and then as a christian we step in and then preach the glorious gospel of lord jesus christ and then they make the informed decisions so uh, on the character of muhammad um uh, uh, robert um uh, age of aisha is very kind of sensitive to muslims muhammad's marriage to zainab is very sensitive to muslims and place of woman is very sensitive to muslims as well as um, latest one is the satanic verses kind of causing some stress within Muslim community. In the biography of Muhammad, any sources you put together does affect my evangelism? No. No, no. there's nothing in the no, Islamic tradition. Like Although Western Islamic apologists will tell you there are Islamic traditions that say that Aisha is older. Actually, there is remarkable unanimity in the Islamic traditions about how young Aisha was, and it seems to have been Sunni Shia polemic, and I discuss this in the book. They're not really interested in pedophilia. They don't really care that he's married to a six-year-old. What they care about is that Ali ibn Abi Talib is so young and is one of Muhammad's first followers. And so the Sunnis created an even younger person, Aisha, to be his follower, to show up the Shia from saying we had the 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 youngest follower of Muhammad who was the first the, to, the purest person who saw early on in his life how wonderful Muhammad was and so it's all about Sunni Shia polemic okay. but nobody's denying that she was actually uh, six when the marriage was agreed to and nine when he raped her this is all taken for granted okay, it's so the same thing with with uh, Zaid and Zainab seems to have been designed a story that was fabricated in order to emphasize that Muhammad had no children, neither natural nor adopted, no sons, that is, because the sons would have been prophets after him. 
and they they would have shared in his prophetic spirit because of they would because they were his sons just as Jesus is Moses' nephew in the Quran. And so in the same way, they have to cut off that Muhammad had any natural or adopted sons to show that he's the last prophet. And so that's that's just an apologetic story designed to show, that to preserve once again the Arab empire by precluding the possibility that there could be a prophet after Muhammad. Okay, so that's... Just Can I just say something on this? Just a second. So therefore, I can say, get the book. Still, Muslims will be on the back foot. Yes, and we, very we, much so. Yeah, we were, More than ever. we were told by Muslim scholars, Islamic scholars, that when Muslims are on the back foot, when they are challenged, and um, surveys show that mainly on the character of Muhammad, they walk out of Islam. Uh, Jay, you kind of dig into Muhammad and sadly after destroying the Quran, you kind of destroy the Muhammad or whoever you call him to be now. Uh, what are the, uh, because it's just all confusing. I don't know which one I need to use the Muslims. So what are the kind of main things we need to focus from your arguments that or dig into from your arguments so that we um, keep Muslims on their back foot, keep Muslims challenged and kept them accountable? Okay, I'm going to answer this two ways, and, and I'm going to follow up from what uh, Robert Spencer said, and also really then tie in this book with uh, with my answer. This These whole questions of whether Muhammad was a pedophile or whether Muhammad uh, was violent or it was, was misogynistic or whether or not he, uh, all these questions are Western questions. These are mu these play much stronger here in the West, in places like London and in the United States. I travel all over the world, and when I travel around the world and I talk to Muslims in places like India or Pakistan, I don't go to Pakistan, but in, in other places in Africa, the Muslims don't see a problem with this. They love this Muhammad. Yes, of course, I wish I could be like Muhammad. What a paradigm. Yes, he destroyed his enemy. I want to be like that. Yes, he led men. What did Jesus do? Jesus was a wimp. He didn't do anything. He never got married, never had children, knew nothing about families. And so this does not play well outside of Europe. So be careful. I think this is much more, this polemic that Hatut's talking about, she's gone off right now. I think she didn't want to hear me say this. This polemic is much more of a European, United States, Western polemic. When it's you get when you get outside anymore. of Europe, when you get outside the United States, what you're doing, Robert, is much more devastating. I'm heading down to Africa right now. They want me there, and I'm going to five different seminaries because they want this material. They don't want this stuff against Muhammad because they see that as hate speech, and they get killed for that. That's yeah. why they don't want to this what we call the bad breath material on Muhammad. They want something that's neutral, that will not kill them, but at the same time destroy Muhammad. What you've done in this book, uh, uh, Robert, is th some of the most devastating material that you can use. That's why this book is much better for the rest of the world. It's also good for Europe and the United States because this book does not get you death threats. This material that you're coming up with, I don't get any strikes on my YouTube channels anymore. I'm not getting death threats. In fact, I'm having Muslims come up to I just had somebody here in Tesco who recognized my voice, came up to me, wanted to shake my hand. He was a Muslim. And he says, I hate what you're saying, but I have so much respect for what you're doing. And what he loved about it is I'm not sitting there mocking Muhammad. I'm just saying he didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And he says, that's much more devastating. I don't know how to answer that. But let me shake your hand and get my picture with you because my son would love to know that I met you. So these kind of things, I think it, it is, it, it is, and Hutton, continue doing that. Don't stop confronting Muhammad. We do need people to talk about his misogyny. We do need people to talk about his violence, especially here in the West. Because in the West, most people look at a, a model for mankind like Jesus Christ. They don't like to say that, but every time they have a problem with Muhammad, it's because they're comparing Jesus with him. And when you compare Jesus with Muhammad, Jesus wins every time. And whether we like it or not, we don't like misogyny here in the West because Jesus doesn't like it. Whether we like it or not, we don't like violence because Jesus didn't like violence. The very thing we hate Muhammad for is because of the fact that Jesus stands in such opposition to him as far as his moral character and as far as his relevancy today. But the deeper question, the one that you're answering in this book, is much more devastating because this is saying, hold on a minute, why waste time on and talking to his misogyny when he didn't even exist? 
Why waste time talking about whether the Quran says this or that or even understanding whether the contradictions when it never was there? It never was there. It was there later, but not earlier. And that's why, in some ways, I really appreciate what you've done here. You've done us a great favor. You put it in a, a readable form. You've put it in a sense of characterization that we can use. And you've given us so many great arguments. Now, you're going to have to write a second and third edition because there's new arguments that now keep that, that, that even add to what you're doing. But they don't okay. take away from what you're doing. They're all going to add, like you did with your, uh, did Muhammad exist in 2012? You had to rewrite it in 2021. God bless you. I'm so glad that you're young and you don't have gray hair like me. You're going to be around for another 40 years. Uh, well, so I, have to, I, I do have to, uh, I don't know about 40 years. It'd be 102. Uh, but in any case, the uh, death threats... I have been getting so many death threats for this book. It's it's astonishing. Quite many more than I usually get. And, for this uh, book? Yeah, this book. Uh, uh, but I don't think, I, I, I would venture to say that the people who are issuing the threats have not read it. Uh, I think that's a problem. They like the idea of it. Once you read the book, it's so, it's so there is no hate speech whatsoever. This is so un-Islamophobic. Uh, and it's exactly what needs to be asked of Muhammad. It has to be asked of every every historical character because every religion does have someone who is a person who lived in history, did certain things at a certain time, at a certain place. Thus, that's what we need to ask. And that's exactly what you're asking. That's it. Well, thank well, you very much. Well, I am very much grateful that um, our God is very kind and very generous. He gives people differently and unique and uh, we faithfully serve him the gifts he's given to us and the resources he's given to us. He give us someone like Jay. He's got amazing brain digging into the historical reliability of Muhammad and the Quran. And then we've got Robert Spencer, amazing brain digging into everything. <laughs> and we end up being in a place, lots of resources in our hands, um, depend which Muslim you speak, where is their background, what is their background, where they come from, uh, how much they know about Islam. Prayfully consider however the Lord leads you. Make sure you challenge the teachings of Islam and preach the glorious gospel of Lord Jesus Christ. Um, with history, with the, like um, holes in the Islamic history as well as holes in the Islamic tradition, Muslims are going to end up in hell unless they put their faith in Lord Jesus Christ. That's the kind of... Uh, bottom line no one can change that so that's how it is at this stage so we step in and i use the resources uh, and the informations we learned and then uh, see where lord takes that um okay any last words um robert spencer any last words before kind of um i think i kind of did my best to keep eye on the chat and then try to bring the questions for you to respond as well um have you got any best, uh, sorry, last words before we kind yeah, of... I, I much appreciate it, and uh, it's very nice to talk to both of you. I suppose the thing I would say in closing is just that the uh, Jay said the book is not uh, offensive, not Islamophobic. I want to make sure people understand this doesn't mean it's Islamic apologetics or that it's <laughs> soft. It's just that it's not... Uh, well, the reputation that I have as being a purveyor of hate speech is entirely fictional and manufactured in order to silence the truths that I tell. And so this it's the same thing with this book. I just set out the facts and then you can evaluate them as you uh, may do. But the facts are the facts, nevertheless. Um, it's simply Islamic sources. So we are, you are just bringing up what Muslims said about Muhammad and if that's kind of hate speech, we can't kind of go back and then murder Muhammad for doing all those kind of things. Um, Jay. That would be like murdering Mickey Mouse. There's nobody there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, let me just say in, in closing, I, I what I think is, is so important, and, and, and thank you so much, Hatun. You've done such an amazing job uh, on your channel here. You've brought some of the best speakers uh, in your channel for many years now. Uh, we love what you did at Speakers Corner. We've just loved what you have done for the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we talk about Muhammad, which we have been tonight, that's been the theme. 
uh, we pretty well know that there was no Muhammad. I think that's been a conclusion. At least um, Robert and I are, con are are convinced that there is no Muhammad. Uh, if there's no Muhammad, there's no Quran, not, not from him, and there's no Mecca. If that is the case, then for all these beautiful Muslims who have been putting their faith in this man as their paradigm, what I want to say to you is for, don't give up. Don't give up. You're not, if there is no Muhammad, why don't you come back to someone who is historical? Why don't you come back to someone who is peaceful? Why don't you come back to someone who died for you and rose again? Why don't you come on home? Come on home to Jesus Christ. He has passed this historical test. The redacted criticism, form criticism, source criticism, all these criticisms that have been applied to Jesus Christ in the last 200 years have been answered by him. And yet he continues to put, keep out and keep putting his hands out and saying, come on home. He wants you to come home. You don't have to put your faith in a man who never existed. Why don't you put in the faith in a man who did exist and who died for you? He loved you so much that he died for you and rose again so you could be with him for eternity. I mean, that's what I would say. Just don't give up on looking for the real, the real paradigm, the real model. And the only one that I can give you is Jesus Christ. But what a man. What a man for today, for you, for us, for any day. Come on home to him. Thank you very much, Jay. Um, so thank you very much, everyone who joined us um, in the stream. Thanks, everyone who interacted with one another and then brought up some questions, as well as thank you, Robert Spencer, for uh, 28th book. <laughs> Not sure if I should be saying thank you for that because it's just like lots of reading and memorization. But thank you. <laughs> thank you. And uh, thank you very much, um, Jay, for coming in. And kind of we live the live stream as what well, Allah knows best if Muhammad was exist, but tradition tells us uh, there are lots of confusing stories and history tells us there was no Muhammad. So by God's grace, by God's grace, we will see you on another live stream. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Bye bye.